Good evening. My name is Gaston Alonso. I am the director of the Ethel R. Wolf Institute for the Humanities at Brooklyn College. I am very excited to welcome you uh, to today's event, tonight's event, Why Medieval Thinkers Are Relevant in 2024. This is the first of a five-part series to celebrate recent books by Brooklyn College faculty um, that the Wolf Institute is hosting this semester. Today, we are celebrating the work of two wonderful members of our community, philosophy professor Andrew Arlick and his book, Medieval Philosophy, A Contemporary Introduction, Routledge 2023, and history professor Lauren Mancia and her book, Meditation and Prayer in the 11th and 12th Century Monastery, Struggling Tower God, ARC Humanities Press 2023. Please join me in giving Andy and Lauren a round of cyber applause. So <laughs> congratulations on these fantastic books. I want to invite you all to join us for other upcoming uh, book events. We are placing the link in the chat that takes you to the schedule for those events. So please join us as we celebrate Brooklyn College's, uh, our colleagues and the amazing work that they do. I also want to invite you to join us during the first week of April for HES Week, a series of eight public events organized to honor the work of this year's HES Scholar in Residence, Paul Ortiz. We have eight events with 25 speakers in four days. Important discussions about academic freedom, the crisis of democracy, the role of solidarity in defending both, and the revolutionary potential of oral history. The link to that week's program is also in the chat, so please join us. And lastly, let me ask you to follow the Wolf Institute on social media so you can learn about all of our upcoming programming. The link to those pages are also in the chat. And with that, let me introduce Professor Nicola Manchian Manchianro. Uh, I told him I was going to mess up his name because uh, even though I've lived in the United States for 50 years, the mic still has a Cuban accent, so I apologize for that. Um, he is professor of English at Brooklyn College, the City University of New York, and a specialist in medieval literature. Among his publications is On the Darkness of the Will, Mimesis 2018, and The Boys of the Hammer, University of Notre Dame Press, 2007. Thank you to all of you for joining us. You are in for, I think, quite a treat. Uh, let me welcome uh, Nicola. You have the microphone. Thank you. Thank you, Gaston. Uh, and thank you for the invitation to participate in this conversation. I'm going to speak for about five minutes, and then uh, Lauren and uh, Andrew will do the same, and then we'll start the conversation proper. So I'd like to open with a seemingly pessimist, but actually super optimist uh, remark. Perhaps like me, you feel hesitant about framing things around relevance, no doubt out of intimate knowledge of your own infinite irrelevance. Is it not enough to do something useful and pleasurable? Must it be relevant too? Calls for relevance feel like part of the restriction of meaning or significance to utility or instrumentality. And as Arendt says in the human condition, utility established as meaning generates meaninglessness. Relevance from relevare to lift up or relieve originally means something helpful, burden lifting, but now sounds like satisfaction of a requirement or legal objection, like justification, which is always uh, somewhat suspicious, as if the good, the true, the beautiful needs a reason to vouch for it. Or worse, it seems entangled in fear of irrelevance, a charge to which the scholar of history might, in the face of worldly powers, feel especially open. As a White House aide once said, we are history's actors, and you, all of you, will be left to just study what we do, the injustice of the just. Yet, and now for the good news, it is just this questionable, questionableness of relevance, per se, that makes it meaningful, helping us to consider the question of today's conversation as no less the question of itself. What were the perennial questions posed by medieval thinkers, and how are they still important to our world in 2024? Did anyone else notice or plant the ambivalence nicely located in the agreement of they, as if coding relevance's amorphous social grammar? 
Are we asking about the importance of medieval thinkers or of perennial questions? Or both and or the same, remembering that great questioners, as Augustine said of Augustine, become questions to themselves. Mihi quaestio factu sum. If the former, then it sounds like we could use some help with our homework. Homework is hard, especially if perennial, homework that never goes away. If the latter, then it sounds like we are not sure what the homework is or if the assignment is still due. Is the perennial not what it used to be? Andrew and Lauren have written books that become the question of medieval relevance in the best way, playing out the both subtle and obvious fact that medieval thinkers and feelers remain in this universe at once as handy helpers with the questions of today and as indispensable friends who lead us into those questions in the first place. In his conclusion, Andrew distinguishes between the dialogue model of value, which prizes a source's utility for us, and the rug dealer model, which is disinterested in connection between past and present concerns, emphasizing the superiority of a combinative model of double alienation, which works through the, quote, interplay of the familiar and the unfamiliar in the historical text to illuminate both the intrinsic value of its object and the blind spots of the present and presentist gaze. And Lauren emphasizing the invention and beauty of the fruitless struggle of medieval monastic devotion draws our attention to the carpet pages of medieval manuscripts. Do we have the image or is that can't be, I'm not sure. We'll, we'll see it in a moment. Oh, there we go. Okay, carpet pages. Um, uh, of medieval manuscripts, folios fully covered with an iconic symmetrical geometric designs looking much like the Persian rugs of later centuries. As a sight of ones becoming more and more, in the words of Gerard of Cambrai, lost in ever fresh amazement uh, before the divine nature of reality. Okay, mixing so mixing these two models up, I'd like to propose as rubric for the relevance of their books, a talking magic carpet model of study, one in which dialogue with the living voices of the dead takes place in a stable flight that makes space for both the cool, distanced sobriety of historical understanding and the fiery, intimate intoxication of mystical bewilderment, producing a relevance no less timely than uplifting. Crucial to their books, in this sense, is their attentiveness to how the question of relevance is internal to their respective medieval sources as records of life, this existence untimely and real beyond relevance. From Al-Ghazali's encounter with global skepticism and realization of having devoted himself to sciences unimportant and useless in this pilgrimage to the hereafter, those are his words, to the darkness and struggle reflected in William of saint Mirror of Faith, which shows how the experience of monastic meditation um, uh, in the 11th and 12th centuries was confusing, disheartening, unsatisfying, and frustrating. Those are Lauren's words. Whether approaching the mountain of reality as a truth to be known and understood or as a perfection to be attained and realized, or both, Andrew's philosophers and Lauren's monks are relevant first of all as themselves in their humanness or individualized existence as ensouled lumps of earth, like fallen and still flying fellow climbers whose footprints show how far there is still to go to catch up to their failures. Thank you. And now we hand it over to Lauren. Hello, everybody. Um, Nicola had such a beautiful introduction to sort of get us into the spirit um, and sort of theory of what it is that we're doing here. I'm going to start us off by recognizing that not all of us might be on the same page when we say medieval. Um, and so I want to help us to all get on that same page by saying that Andrew and I and Nicola all study the period between 500 and 1500 um, in Europe and the Mediterranean. 
And um, that area, the medieval world, has traditionally been thought of just as being restricted to Europe and is increasingly being thought of as a global medieval world that includes places like the Byzantine Empire and Greece and uh, Mali and other places like that. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about my book first before handing it over to Andrew and say that my book is interested in medieval monasticism. Um, after Jesus dies, um, people are wondering how it is that they can be holy people. And one of the solutions that they come to is that they could live as hermits in the desert and be ascetics, living in caves and things. Um, and by the sixth century, they realize that that's really hard, that it's easier to study in a group than it is to study alone. And so they decide to all come together in monasteries and live by a very strict rule that will help through discipline regulate their lives so that they can be pure enough to, for their prayers to reach God. And monasticism up through the 12th century, especially, is a kind of currency, it's a kind of ec economy, a spiritual economy in medieval Europe, um, because medieval monks are the people who are praying for everybody. So they're not just praying for themselves, they recognize that the serfs and the peasants who are working in the field don't have time to pray or literacy to pray, and that the knights and the kings who are killing people regularly um, aren't necessarily in the best place to get their prayers up to God. So the monastery is created as a way of understanding how communication with God can happen um, in a purified, as purified as possible context. What's interesting is that by the 11th and 12th century, everyone in Europe pretty much has been converted to Christianity and monasticism gets sort of like a new lease on life where people in the monasteries, and now we're talking about hundreds of monasteries across Europe, North Africa, um, throughout the, the region. And those, those monasteries have sometimes between 50 and 200 monks in them. So this is really, it's a hot ticket. Um, and the reason why it's so interesting and so popular in the 11th and 12th centuries is because they're really laboratories for innovation for Christianity. So people have stopped just basic conversion, right? Let's make sure people know that our father and get on with it, right? And they've started to really think about, okay, well, it's actually hard to pray the our father and feel like we mean it. And so they spend a lot of time thinking about the nitty gritty of these problems. Um, and that's the period that my book um, sort of takes place in. I'm interested in how monks are feeling about their extra liturgical prayer, the prayer that they're doing outside of the eight hours a day where they have to be in church and praying. And um, medieval monastic history in the 11th and 12th centuries is really amazing because we have incredibly fragmentary sources. And the reason why I think that that's really amazing is that it's not only texts and books that I can learn about medieval monasticism from, it's also buildings and art and music. And so my book is attempting to see how the whole monastery is created as a space to enable um, meditation. And I study what the ideal for that meditation is, and then as best I can, what the real experience of that meditation was, which is often struggle and failure. Even though they failed a lot, um, in my opinion, it was still a super exciting place to be up through the 12th century. And one of the reasons it changes a little bit is because starting in the 12th century, we have the birth of the universities in medieval Europe. And that's where Andrew's book comes in. Take it away. Well, thank you, Lauren. Um, I I want to just say first um, that uh, I'm humbled to be here, uh, especially in such great company uh, with Lauren and Nicola. Uh, I want to thank Gaston and the Wolf Institute for setting this up. Um, and, uh, and, and Lauren and I, uh, it's a real... Like I said, it's really fun um, having being in the same space as her. Um, we overlap in kind of our um, in our research. We overlap a lot in kind of the area and the time in which we um, do our work. Uh, but my book uh, 
sort of is much more expansive than that. Um, as Lauren mentioned, the Middle Ages, well, there's some dispute, as I note in my book, about when it starts and when it ends. And I'm actually one of those very generous persons. Um, uh, yes, 500s to 1500s, but then I actually tend to see medievalism permeating into even further centuries because um, I start tracking, you might say, the spirit of um, the way philosophy is done. And so you can see instances of it, I think, as far up as the 1700s, if not after that. Um, my book also uh, focuses not just on Europe and it doesn't just focus on the universities, but uh, also sees um, interconnections to a much wider region, including the eastern portion of the Mediterranean uh, and the Central Asian steppes, so greater Persia, we might say. Um, and, and I try to show that all of these people are in conversation with one another, not necessarily because they can read each other's texts, but the ideas are very much finding ways to make um, their way to various people um, at various places in time. Um, now, my my book uh, is, as Nicola and Gaston mentioned, um, it's called A Contemporary Introduction. And when I was approached to do the book, um, I, my, I understood my mandate to be to write a book in a series that's geared towards um, students who've just taken an intro level course as an undergraduate student in a college uh, and are now um, what you should be trying to do is entice them to enter into your particular subfield of philosophy. So it was very much, I, I, I thought very hard about, okay, well, what's going to attract someone who's just had a little bit of philosophy and what's going to get them hooked and drawn into medieval uh, per se. And I also had, you know, my eye on the, the mythical uh, general educated reader, but it wasn't meant to be, you know, uh, it was, so it was meant to be uh, overviewish. Um, and I decided to tackle the things thematically as opposed to trotting you through historical figures and periods. Um, and, uh, and that allowed me some freedom to pick uh, which themes and topics to really highlight because the book was also not supposed to be a doorstop. It was supposed to be thin, uh, affordable, and um, something not too intimidating uh, for um, people who want to see if this is for them. Um, so there's some of the kind of meat and potatoes. Those of you who are philosophy students, you know, you, you kind of are aware of our curriculum. And there's some of that meat and potato stuff there. For instance, metaphysics and epistemology, that is the theory of knowledge. But even there, I... Um, I have a, a pretty um, intense chapter on some of the building blocks of their theories, but that was important to do because it provided a kind of conceptual framework, um, as I saw it, for everything else. Um, the much more, dare I say, more important stuff that I thought people would be interested in. Um, because um, one thing that's kind of I think true of the medievals in general is that they they are believers in the idea that um, understanding nature, understanding the nature of reality really will give you some insight into your place in reality and therefore how you ought to live. Um, and um, so the same thing with epistemology. I, um, and I think we're going to come back to this. I was less interested in getting into some of the arcane technical stuff involving medieval theories of cognition and how the mind works. But instead I was, I pursued the idea of skepticism and certainty and what do we do when we can't be certain? Um, because I thought that that was a more, um, a, a better way of in to, to thinking about some of this stuff because I wanted to turn to the more important stuff in a way, um, or at least I thought the things that would, people would gravitate to, and those are ideas of human flourishing, including um, uh, finding your way to the ultimate end of things, which is re reunion, you either union or reunion with God. And I also was extremely interested in pursuing some themes in um, medieval political philosophy. Um, and 
in addition, uh, and by kind of framing this this way, I, I also started going into some um, underexplored avenues through voices that are often um, relatively neglected in um, other treatments of this stuff. And just to give you an example, I have, um, I took um, an interest in, for instance, uh, medieval attitudes towards other living things besides humans and the environment more generally. Um, when I thought about ethics, I thought about in terms of love and friendship. Um, one of the big things I was interested in when thinking about political questions was um, the, um, was propaganda, censorship, and more generally freedom of thought, or the freedom, as I call it in the book, to be wrong, and whether there was such a thing. Um, I was interested in pursuing the issue of uh, democracy, and there's a very strong current of skepticism about democracy in this period. And kind of more broadly, I was interested in um, the tension between what human reason uh, arrives at for conclusions um, and what uh, you're taught by tradition and revealed texts. Now, and I, again, kind of remember my mandate, I thought that these were things that might grab us might immediately sort of strike us as relevant and um, interesting to pursue. But, um, and I do wanna kind of say though, and I think Nicola kind of picked up on this and, and hopefully we can pursue this more or I invite us to, but just because I um, think that my medieval thinkers um, are tuned into some things that we're still interested in, I'm not gonna argue that the way they go about answering that, let alone the solutions they offer are ones that are kind of ready for us to just pick up and run with ourselves. Um, and that's something I think, again, Nicola alluded to when I, uh, at the very end of the book, I talk about what's the point of doing medieval philosophy? Is there a point of doing history philosophy period? And what's, is there a point of doing the history of medieval philosophy? And that was where I was trying to say, look, um, it's not like these people are, your colleague down the hall, but rather they're, it's much stranger than that. And that's one of the most exciting things about it is because you have to find a way to communicate with these people across time and space. Um, and by doing so, it might change your perspective on some of the things that are troubling you. Um, and with that, I think um, I'm happy to turn things back over to our moderator and let's have a more um, organic conversation at this point. Thank you, Andrew. <clears throat> so my first question I wanna to pose to you all is kind of about the major figures, uh, principal figures in your books. And in The Passion, according to GH, Clarice Lispector writes, the gradual deheroization of oneself is the true labor one works at beneath the apparent labor. Life is a secret mission. So secret is the true life that not even to me who am dying of it can the password be entrusted. I die without knowing where from. Who are the heroes and or de-heroes, individual or collective of your books and why? And also, are there any conspicuously uninvited guests or figures you would have liked to have given uh, more attention to in your work? Well, maybe I'll go first since Lauren passed off the torch to me by um, mentioning those scholastics. That is the dudes in the universities that are just starting to take off at the end of her period. Um, in standard issue treatments of medieval philosophy that focuses primarily on what's been going on in these universities. Um, Paris is one of the first, Oxford's another big one, and then there are a number of others around um, what we now think of as Western Europe uh, going into Central Europe. Um, one of the, I don't like to make enemies, but I guess one of the funny, I think one of the things you might be struck by, especially if you know a little bit about medieval history and if you're or medieval philosophy and you're comparing my book to others, is the um, the fact that I don't center those people. I don't put them at the center. And 
um, and then describe everybody else's sort of contributing to their enterprise. I tried to do something a little bit more radical, suggesting um, that there was a whole lot of interesting stuff going on outside the university. And so I, um, I do mention, for instance, Thomas Aquinas, who's probably as close to a household name as you could get. Um, I, I do mention him from here, from time to time, take some of his theories seriously. But in general, some of the other big scholastic figures like William of Ockham or Dun John Dun Scotus, um, they don't get a lot of attention in my book, um, just because I had other people I wanted to introduce you to. And again, I didn't want to make it a doorstop. Um, so I guess in a way, I kind of treated them as um, uh, people that give the cold shoulder to, to some degree, so that I could welcome some other people in. But I couldn't welcome everybody into the tent. Um, and I do regret that um, I just didn't have enough time um, to, to really bring in a lot of Byzantine authors. And for that matter, um, I think uh, I didn't give, uh, I didn't give voice to, or didn't give a platform to as many of the wonderful Jewish Muslim or Ju Jewish um, medieval figures out there. Um, there's a kind of decided um, Islamic bent um, to my book uh, because in part, those are many of the people I felt like I knew best and liked a lot and um, found that they were talking about the things that I wanted to talk about. Um, and that's just where it sort of the book ended up pivoting. Um, Anyway, uh, that those those are my I guess how I'd answer that question, Nicola. I um, as I was choosing the uh, heroes of my book to weave my story together, I was making sure that I was choosing folks who were all translated into English in easily accessible uh, translations, so that the idea is that my book's going to be a little gateway drug for everyone to get super hooked on Anselm of Canterbury and Peter of Sell and Hildegard of Bingen and Elizabeth of Schonau, right? Like these are the these are the hot ticket items. Um, and I think that the other thing, the other heroes of my book are medieval monuments, you know, manuscripts or buildings that I desperately wanted to talk about. <laughs> Um, so in some ways, my book is a, a manifesto that is integrating my voice and my take on all of these people into one sort of message. Um, so not there's no single voice that sort of comes out, um, but there's the Benedictine and Cistercian methodology. So those are the two orders of monks that I'm focusing on. Yeah, and that, and thanks for that, Lauren. Because I I too was trying to pick stuff that was readily accessible. So I um, I I don't assume too many people know Latin or Arabic or Greek or any uh, Farsi, um, you know, Persian. Um, yeah. So and that of course constrained things too, because uh, you know the unfortunate fact is there's just a lot less in translation um, for some of these periods. I think one of the things, I mean, as Andy was saying, right, you know, we all know Aquinas, right? Um, the medieval is often this sort of dark gully um, in your standard history textbook, in your standard History 101 course, and history of any kind, right? Art History 101, Philosophy 101, History 101, etc. And so I think that while some medievalists might know Al-Ghazali or might know Anselm of Canterbury, we've written these books in part because we think everyone should know who they are. Um, and the fact that people don't read them means that they often think that modern people invented ideas or problems um, or questions or art, right? That is actually very much inspired by medieval thinkers who were read very extensively by people like Luther or Lorca, right? So there are all of these people in the post-medieval period who love these characters that we no longer read in school because the Regents doesn't teach before 1492 anymore or whatever, right? But, you know, like this is why we are featuring them. Okay, let's move on to the next question. Um, 
this is a question about uh, doubt, I think, basically. Um, in her book, The Cloud of the Impossible, or it's not the cloud, rather, it's cloud of the impossible, Catherine Keller writes, the clouds accumulate, storm front of the apocalypse. I mind them, I wonder. I feel the loss of a certainty I never knew. And I notice a more subtle cloud. Both of your books foreground experiences on the spectrum of epistemological affects, except perhaps despair wasn't quite included in there. Um, Andrew, with your opening chapters on medieval skepticism and the mind matter bending puzzles of hylomorphism. Lauren, with your emphasis in chapter three on doubt, self-doubt, and questioning as what, quote, ignites the experience of divine truth. I think a deep and overarching sense of uncertainty in the face of this mysterious reality, as opposed to the all too modern practice of worrying about the world as a problem we can solve, is one of the most attractive moods or aspects of medieval culture. And this is brought to a theological point, very succinct, I think, by uh, John Buridan, whom, whom Andrew quotes, since you know nothing about the will of God, you cannot be certain about anything. What a relief to know that one does not, to drop the burden of certainty and notice a more subtle cloud. Can you, um, each of you, elaborate a little more on your investment in the uncertain and how it may relate to the pleasure or joy or relevant relief you find in medieval studies? Mm -hmm. I'm going to start us off by quoting a medieval, okay? I'm going to read, I'm going to, for those of you following along, this is from page 49 of my book. <laughs> so this is William of St. Thierry. And he's a, a monk in the 12th century. Um, and one of the reasons I wrote this book is because I think um, the picture that we have of monasticism is from a secular point of view, and also the picture that we have of Catholic monasticism, thanks to people in the Reformation throwing shade at Catholic monasticism and Henry VIII dissolving the monasteries, all of that stuff, right? The picture we have is that they're all sort of like, cocksure, like know everything, like the worst kind of professor you've ever had, right? Um, and I think what's so amazing about them is that in the 11th and 12th century, they're not like that. So this is William of St. Thierry who says, the faithful some stumble quite often. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. And someone else says, how does God know? Or how is their knowledge in the most high? He has doubts about the providence of God. Someone else wonders, if for the salvation of humans, God ought to have made human. And there are many things along this line, even minds quite fervent in religion, but still rather immature in faith, often undergo this kind of temptation. They do not say yes, yes, or no, no, but whisper, maybe, maybe, maybe it is so, they say, maybe it is not, maybe it is otherwise, maybe it is other than it is written, on account of something that was never written down, right? That kind of insecurity and uncertainty is the best position from which to teach, right? First of all, right? That we as teachers know that asking questions that have no answer are, create the most fruitful conversations in classrooms, right? Um, they are in some ways the most rewarding, maybe not for scientists, I don't know, <laughs> but for humanists, certainly, right? Um, and so this is what monks are doing all the time. They're like, look, there's this perfect ideal of God and I can't reach him. I know I absolutely can't. I can't pretend that I can if I'm going to be a good monk. So how do I deal with this imperfection and this constant failure? How do I deal with not knowing anything? How do I deal with the fact that the more I know, the more I don't know? And those feel like incredibly rewarding ways to sort of think about being human instead of being obsessed all the time with acquiring the last bit of knowledge that will make you know everything, which doesn't happen. Uh, I mean, in some ways that this is like one of the big, exciting themes running through my book is, um, I mean, how to frame it. Uh, I mean, there's a one way to go into it is um, I, like Lauren, am struck by the honest intellectual humility of many of our heroes 
and heroines in this um, in this period. Um, there's a there's also uh, I pursue a lot the idea of this reunion with God, um, and I guess maybe I'll, I'll push Lauren a little bit. At least some of my people think maybe this is achievable, um, even if only momentarily before we die. Um, and they're wondering what it's going to be like. And some of them claim to have had this experience. And the ones who claim that they've had this experience, um, one of the fascinating things about it is they're tongue-tied often. This stuff just doesn't make sense. Um, and uh, and you might think, well, okay. And they'll say things like, anything you say is going to be um, is going to be wrong. And so your first question might be, well, then why are you writing anything at all? Why don't you just shut up? Um, but they don't. And that's because there's, and this is, I think, the thing that's fascinating to me, is this, this, this urge to still say something and to still try to know it, even though you've realized that you're a finite creature that um, is attempting to understand the infinite. Um, or even just the really huge, right? So the universe itself is also really huge. And then the, uh, and many of the figures I study are well aware that even at the end of the day, you might have this kind of, they have this, someone will have this kind of authoritative stance, like this is how the world is. But I think there's a, for many of them, an admission even there that we don't know the full details of, um, we don't know the essence of a fly. Um, you know, in full, right? We, we, our minds kind of get close-ish to it, but we don't get the full view. Um, I will say just as an addition, but because uh, this is part of the interesting tension that's running throughout this, is this, this, um, this faith that the, that God is a reasonable creature is driven by reason and therefore makes a world that behaves according to rules and reason. And even if we can't understand it all, we so as Nicola said, we we don't know the will of God, but we we also, at the same time, these people who say we don't know God's will and plans thoroughly, they tend not to think that um, God's capricious or just sort of doing things willy nilly, right? That um, there is a plan. Uh, there is a reason behind it, even if we can't, because we're finite, understand it. Um, and so that's, like I said, it's a theme that, um, it's one of these themes that kind of is a thread that literally sews together my book, um, so to speak, because it's uh, it's a thing I kind of pursue in various ways, shapes, and forms throughout the chapters that I have. And it, it creates a deep curiosity throughout the Middle Ages, right? Among the elites, right? We, we must acknowledge, right, that 95% of the people are enserved and, you know, that's not necessarily who we're talking about here, right? But among the elites, right, this curiosity drives whole lives, creates religious movements, creates wars, you know? I mean, I think that that it's kind of an amazing raison d'etre um, that, slowly changes over the course of a thousand years, but not too much in my view. And then with the early modern period, it all just falls apart, right? So if you think, but if you think about like the en enlightenment and the sort of age of the encyclopedia, like now humans have so much control over all knowledge that they will categorize it, right? And of course, this is what's gonna breed racial categorization and all kinds of horrible things, right? Not to say that that horrible stuff wasn't in the Middle Ages also, but they didn't feel like they really could have a hold on it the way that moderns do or enlightenments do, I guess. Super, thank you all. Um, so I have another question, which is about reason and faith, essentially. Um, each of your books in different ways addresses this relation between reason and faith and more specifically the complex boundaries between the intellective versus affective and apophatic versus cataphatic approaches to reality. In short, the questions of head and heart. 
And on this point, I especially liked Lauren's emphasis on the invention and beauty that came out of the fruitless struggle of medieval monastic devotion. You used that word, kind of peppered your text with this word beauty. Um, and in Andrew's case, the little heartfelt pedagogical uh, touches, um, such as in a footnote to a question of situational ethics, he says, for the record, I'd like to say that my father is a rather enlightened and is rather enlightened, not a bigot. I still think he is wrong on occasion, but then I too am wrong about a lot of things. I love you, dad. Um, this question of head heart balance is a, a, no less a critical issue in debates about the humanities. Um, for starters, our method of study, also known as criticism, is born uh, in the separation of head and heart, defined by Agamben as the schism of the word in Western culture. And arts sciences, you were already talking about this, Lawrence, sort of arts sciences split between a word that is unaware and enjoys the object of knowledge by representing it in beautiful form, and a word that has all the seriousness and consequences for itself, but does not enjoy its object because it does not know how to represent it. So criticism, kind of understood in these terms, which is certainly not exhaustive, but it sort of makes a strange home in the distance between the two. And Agamemnon says criticism neither knows, so it's neither science nor represents, but knows the representation. So how do you approach these dichotomies in your work, both in your interpretation of sources, but also I'm curious to hear in the style and method of your scholarship as work that tries to be relevant in one way or another? There's, yeah, the, I think one of the reasons why the scholastic dudes have gotten so much coverage is because what they do is recognizably, immediately recognizable as philosophy as contemporary philosophers understand it. It's all positions and arguments, all this, um, um, and distinctions and stuff like that. Um, and um, many of the heroes and heroines of my book, and especially emphasis maybe on the heroines, um, well, they weren't allowed in the university, or there wasn't a parallel in, part, in various parts of the world um, for the university and its curriculum and so forth. And um, what I wanted to, and, and this isn't, by the way, original to me, um, I learned a lot from my, my partner, um, Christina Van Dyke, and her wonderful book called The Hidden Wisdom, um, where she tries to show you that um, people who have often been dismissed as uh, mystics are in fact really good philosophers. Um, now, it just so happens that they they do speak in a different idiom than the scholastic guys do. Um, and so it's harder in some ways for someone who's trained in academic philosophy to necessarily see it. But, um, but I think a very convincing case has been made that yes, what they're doing is philosophy. And 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 I like that because I, I'm very much, um, um, on board with the idea that we need to be much more generous in thinking about what counts as philosophy. Um, the old way of thinking of things is very um, narrow-minded, and it makes us um, makes us poor uh, intellectual playmates with the other disciplines. Um, so, I guess that's it. maybe in a nutshell, kind of how I see various people that I bring in um, showing us that there's a different way. And many of these people, the mystics are, um, are where the effective parts of, um, you know, discourse where, you know, um, there's a, there's a, a deep interest in embodiment and what it means to be embodied um, and, um, and trying to, um, you might say, formulate a philosophy that takes that, seriously and doesn't just sort of try to be a rarefied um, series of abstract propositions that you chop down to abstract conclusions from. Um, it's a it's a living and breathing philosophy, you might say. Uh, maybe I'll step with that and let Lauren jump in because her people, many of them were part of this tradition too, um, so to speak. Yeah. When I when I was first studying monasticism, I had my first chapter conference for my dissertation, 
And in that chapter, I had like categorized, like, these are the parts of the text that are intellectual. And these are the parts of the text that are emotional, you know, and my dissertation committee was super invested in that. And they were like looking for a proto-scholastic language and the intellectual parts and whatnot. And halfway through the chapter conference, I was like, this isn't working. <laughs> I was like, these monks live 24 hours a day with their faith seeking this understanding. That's a quote from this guy Anselm. And I was like, they, I can't start to make a lexicon of words that are affective versus words that are intellectual. That doesn't work. Um, and so that was like the first moment where I opened up to this idea that like head plus heart is actually how medieval thinking works. And what's interesting about that, again, and I'm going to keep throwing shade at the Enlightenment, <laughs> but I, I think that, you know, especially in the 19th century and in the invention of the, the university, right, the invention of history departments and all that stuff, right, there is a real effort to make the humanities scientific, and that meant to take the heart out of it, right? It's, it's not the human, it's not a history paper about your grandma. It's not a history paper about how you feel about Abraham Lincoln. It's a history paper that is entirely based on archival evidence that is objective and that your heart is not in at all. So you are not biased, right? And I think that with fields like affect studies, we're sort of coming around to the fact that like and de and with deconstruction, right? With just the linguistic turn, we realize that that's not true, right? That we cannot be objective examiners of these texts as historians, right? But what's interesting is that the medieval people knew that, right? They knew they were postmodern. They were pre-modern and yet they were postmodern in the way that they know those th knew those things. So that's important for us, I think, as st people who study the Middle Ages to understand that combination is not a dichotomy. And I think it's also important for us as, as professors who are pursuing um, sort of research, right, to understand that we do have our hearts invested in this material and that to shield that from our colleagues as well as our students, I mean, to shield it from our students is, is the kiss of death, right? But to shield it from our colleagues might be silly also, right? And I think there's like a slowly growing turn in scholarship uh, led by a lot of affect theorists that are trying to do that. Um, but I think that the the real thing that this this gets my goat about is that, you know, when we think about how we market learning to the university students that are at Brooklyn College, to high school students even, right? We think about it as objective, data-driven, go where the job is going to be, right? that it is supposed to be a pursuit that is intellectual, that is smart, right? I'm gonna choose the career path as opposed to one driven by the heart, that there is a there is a discounting of the heart. Um, and that, you know, the medievals would have thought that was crazy. <laughs> and so I think we should take a page out of the out of their book and, you know, plaster and some of Canterbury all across the walls of the advising office. No, that would be horrible, but you know. <laughs> hey, Lauren, I, I and Nicola, I know, you know, we were going to eventually, and I'm eager to do this soon, uh, open up the floor to questions from the audience, but it looked like Jocelyn and chat had one that might be directly relevant to what Lauren had just said. Is that okay to have it? I'll, I'll just take my liberty as co-host here and just see if you want to take that up for a moment. Of course. Yes. Jocelyn, first of all, gets the award for zooming in from Malta. It's like 1 a.m. <laughs> um, so I, you know, have started um, to think about this this very question, right, of how it is that we can try to recover the experience of the heart, historical experience, through changing the methodology that we do scholarship. So this is connected to what Nicola was asking at the end there too, right? And so one of the ways that I'm experimenting this year on sabbatical with doing this is by engaging 
um, engaging my body, right, um, by performing monastic actions in order to try to recover some of the experience that historical people felt. And this is like a very sort of careful needle that I have to thread because it's not historical reenactment. It's not creative anachronism. It's not um, Christian mass, you know what I mean? Um, but there is something to the doing of some of these activities that historians for the sake of objectivity have said we should not do, that we should just stay with texts that we can read and not attempt to recover the traces of movement and feeling and such that might have been outside of these texts and around these texts. And so this is this is part of what I'm trying to do. So as Jocelyn mentioned, I went to a monastery. It was fantastic. Lots of amazing chant. Well, actually, if I can just quickly pick up on that, one of my heroes in the book is a guy named Ibn Tufail, who writes what might be arguably one of the first science fiction novels that we know of. It's a philosophical tale. Um, it certainly seems to have inspired someone like, um, yeah, Robinson Crusoe. Um, but anyway, uh, one of the things that this hero does is he achieves union with God. He reunites with God. Um, and so there you get some of this discussion of, gosh, it's so vast, I can't put it into words, but then I'm going to go on and tell you something about it, says to file. Um, but on this way, he, um, and, and one of the nice things about this book is it's, a, it, it's in a way a kind of compendium of, um, of a very common way of doing or thinking about medieval philosophy. And what this character susses out he, he self-teaches himself, but one of the things he realizes he has to do is um, spin in a circle to emulate the movement of the planets. Now, anybody who's sort of seen whirling dervishes can see that there's a connection to Sufism or Islamic mysticism here. But kind of that's part of the rationale for this is in part that um, both Lauren's heroes and my heroes and heroines um, understood the soul to be multifaceted and included um, aspects that had to be, for you to achieve, even if you thought of reunion with God as being a highly abstract intellectual thing, you still had to train the soul to be ready to reason. And part of that had to be getting the other parts in line. And one of the ways you did that was do these kind of ritualistic embodied kind of practices like med you know various forms of um not just meditation but you know physical parts with it so um here's another kind of i, I just had the riff off this lauren because you know this is just so important for these people for many of them even even the scholastics were doing this kind of stuff you know at night i suspect right they they didn't forget their bodies either um because their theory told them that that part of their soul was very much glued in and integrated with the body. And so it had to be, it had to be addressed too. It was not just head, but heart had to be addressed for you to really be ready to flourish and to meet your maker. Yes, yes. And this is, you know, Nicola, this is connected to your sort of political question, right? This is, you know, one of the one of the reasons why we feel it's urgent to study the Middle Ages is because this kind of intentional life that is attending to all of the facets of life in order to channel them into one purpose, right? Which is not how everybody lives, not how everybody lived in the Middle Ages either, right? But isn't that amazing, right? To think about, you know, what that intention is while you're taking a bath, to think about what that intention is while you're eating, to think about what that intention is as you're walking through the tr the streets. Like, I mean, not just while you're studying. It's amazing. Yeah, keep your mind where your body is. But then there's the fable of the philosopher that falls in the ditch, right? Looking up at the stars. I, you have to do a little bit of both. But um, yeah, so the political question was... Um, pretty simple. It's just, I guess it has to do with the world, you know, and um, prototypically monks renounce the world to dwell communally in wilderness. 
while philosophers live in the world as more or less cosmopolitan strangers. Both have weird or non-standard, if not vexed, relations to the state. And think of Socrates, of course. Uh, as Andrew investigates in his final chapter, The Philosopher in Society, and Lauren in your concluding portrait of monasticism as passionate and pragmatic collective endeavor, totally committed to something way more important than personal achievement or gratification. Can you say more about the political lessons of medieval philosophy and monasticism? Andy, I feel like you talk explicitly about politics in your book. Mm -hmm. you yeah, I, I well, yes, I, I I'm interested. As I mentioned in my opening spiel, I um, focus on um, a strand of Platonic political philosophy that gets developed, especially in the Islamic world, but um, you know, not exclusively. Um, and it's one that's uh, very there's a lot that trouble uh, that there's a lot that ought to trouble us in what they say or um because they are extremely um skeptic uh extremely elitist lauren had used the word earlier elitism and and i think we should remind ourselves that the for both of our people these are you know people that um have the luxury to to tune out, drop out, or to study, to get into book learning, right? Most people are not in a position to do this. Um, so they're the elites. Um, and the, well, the, not surprisingly, sometimes the elites think that they should be in charge um, and they can formulate arguments for why they ought to be in charge and um, why you shouldn't give reins over to the masses who are ruled by their passions and not by their heads. Um, uh, even if they're, you know, I said, Laura and I both agree on this head and heart matter. You have to have both, but you definitely need the head to guide the heart in some ways and to help shape it in the right sort of ways. Otherwise you're, um, yeah, otherwise <laughs> it's extremely problematic. So so I very much explore that. And I don't uh, wanna go over too long. Um, in, in what I say, I guess here, but I, but that was one of the things that's um, was extremely fascinating to me, and that and the my issues with propaganda, censorship, freedom of thought, all kind of um, is fallout from um, thinking about who ought to be in charge um, and who ought to be you know if you have people in charge, uh, then you got people who are subordinated to it and. Um, and what do you, what do we think about that? Um, and do we have, one of the ways I kind of tried to put it, it was like, yeah, we're not gonna like this, right? Because we're we're all here in the States, like, you know, raised to say democracy, um, you know, no other way. And I I was sort of seeing it as, well, hey, let's, let's hear them out. Um, and then let's try to think about how we would respond to them because they've got arguments. Do we have anything that we can show is a reason to reject this kind of elitist model where the philosophers are in charge. Um, so that's at least one kind of strand in, and one way in which I felt like this stuff spoke to us um, because it challenges us um, in some very interesting ways. But Lauren, please. No, totally. I mean, I think that studying anything in the pre-modern world takes our modern assumptions and tries to dismantle them and allows us to try to see a world that looks very much like ours, um, how different choices could be made, different assumptions could be made. You know, for monasticism, it's that, you know, there's a there's a whole sort of string of historians who think that it's sort of after the 12th century that there is a quote, discovery of the individual, that this sort of like self-centered pick yourself up by your bootstraps thing, that identity um, only comes a little bit later in the Middle Ages. Um, and I think that that's, you know, we could debate the fine points of that, but I think that monastic community is incredibly revolutionary, right? I mean, it's a utopian community where, 
you know, one of the one of the things that the Reformation does, right, is it it makes us think of the the Catholic Mass as hierarchical, and it certainly is, right? But in a monastic community, a different monk is the priest every day. And so every day you have a different monk who's ministering the Eucharist to people. And he's the, you know, everyone is, is the sinner but him, let's say. And then the next day, a whole bunch of other people are, are sorry, I'm not being clear here, right? They change who's in charge, right? They change who is the person who has the power to administer that sacrament. And that's a really radically um, equal, equal way of being. Um, when Catholicism goes into lay spaces, the hierarchy seems to be different, right? Who has access to Latin, et cetera. But in a monastic space, the community is essential um, to how to, to their faith formation. Um, and so that is really, I think, not a very common thing in modernity. We like increasingly are going by ourselves into our rooms with our devices, et cetera, right? And in the monastery, they're reading next to each other, they're eating next to each other, they're praying next to each other, they're sleeping next to each other, right? It's a little much, <laughs> but it's because they really think that this can only happen in community and in the challenges of community. So that's my particular interest. So this tension remains about the relation between philosophy and monasticism to the state. It seems like on the one hand, you're saying it's revolutionary and uh, and radical. On the other hand, you're saying it's leisure, it's revolutionary leisure. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe it's both. I mean, as with the Beguines, it seems like some of the communities are sort of like maybe more middle class like uh, condo situations. And then there's, uh, you know, the Marguerite Porettes who are kind of refusing to... Uh, fall into line. Um, I just, I know it's a bigger question maybe for another day about sort of the 20th, 21st century sort of situation of state power in the university. Uh, so we'll just, and neo-medievalism you mentioned in your book, Lauren, um, at the end. But it seems like we are in a world where uh, there's a kind of neo-feudal um, you know, uh, structure uh, of networks of allegiance and people just uh, seeking protection of stronger powers. But um, so, but that's a world in which, yeah, coll collective, you know, collective action and reinvention of institutions sort of by some sort of um, passionate uh, gathering uh, method, I guess, uh, becomes more imperative. But we, I think there was a question, um, we're almost winding down, but there was a question from, um, was it Lino's asking in the chat about um, the distinction between monk and nun and about nuns in other in religions other than Christianity? Um, so the, the biggest distinction between monks and nuns is that nuns are technically not allowed to be ordained priests. And so that means that in a monastic community of women, they're supposed to outsource their priest, a male priest. Um, and what's interesting about that is that there have been fantastic books written about how women get around that idea um, and how they are ministering to each other in ways that are supposed to be the responsibility of this male priest. Um, otherwise, monk and nun, the, the sort of distinction between convent and monastery as a gendered space is a modern distinction. So in the Middle Ages, they're both monasteries. Um, their architecture is the same. They do the same readings. Um, sometimes every monastery has different saints. So a female monastery might have more female saints. Um, but essentially for the 11th and 12th centuries, it's the same. It starts being different when you break the wall of the cloister and you have mendicant orders going outside of the walls and interacting with lay people. And then you have a whole new sort of gendered experience of monasticism, you know, again, in the late Middle Ages. Um, but there's so much, you know, you should, Lena, you just need to take my medieval history class in the fall, right? <laughs> and the nuns have, I mean, my book is on 11th and 12th century. Like, there's some crazy writings by nuns and it gets even better as you go later. That hidden wisdom book in the chat is for you. Uh, there is a follow-up question from Ellen Tremper about, um, she, she writes, but aren't there brothers and priests? 
who have different places in the hierarchy headed by an abbot. Um, I'm not sure if she's asking about fraternal orders, but that could also be, well, speak to her question, but I I think I should also want to add to that because um, the fraternal orders kind of get, um, are sort of missing, I guess, between your books a little bit. Although, Andrew, of course, you're dealing with some prior philosophers like Bonaventure and so forth. But um, so, yeah, brother priests, do you see? Yes, there are, you mean there are some ordained monks? Is that what she's asking? Not all monks are ordained. So some okay, are just- Okay, so you you answered that, I guess. But okay. anything about the fraternal orders or I mean the, the mendicant orders who kind of revolutionize monasticism in many ways? <laughs> Andy, do you want us, do you want us to take that one? I mean, I don't have anything particularly enlightening to say um, about that as a kind of sociological or historical phenomenon. Um, it's certainly many of the, the major figures in, covered in standard textbooks are of one of these mendicant orders. So Thomas's, St. Thomas of Aquinas is a Dominican. Um, Dun Scotus and Occam are both Franciscan and so forth and so on. Um, but I, yeah, I, I can't, I, I'm not sure I'm expert enough to really speak about the phenomena of the mendicant orders. Um, it is significant, right, that they, um, that they um, developed. Um, and there's funny things about, you know, they basically set up competitors for the university and basically forced the university to bring them inside or lose students but that's the kind of end of my depth of knowledge about that <laughs> but yeah the, i mean you know, go ahead Nic nicola go oh, ahead i'm just saying the whole principle of living a ruled or regular life in the middle of worldly society i mean there were canons uh before but um this is revolutionary thing uh and i guess you could say prepares the way for the what max weber <laughs> describes as the monastery leaving the 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 cloister altogether and applying the rules of you know monastic discipline to all orders of, of life and quantification of time and <laughs> economy and so forth um yes. so uh yeah and and also attention to the world as as the you know the, this creation in front of your face as the experimental the laboratory of of knowledge um, there is a question from Sarah, if we have time, um, which is about economics. Uh, in your opinion, what aspects or currents of medieval economic thought seem to be the most relevant for our late capitalist times? Hmm. Um, that's a, the, there's a, a interesting lacuna. I, I mean, I, I my book couldn't do it all, and it definitely didn't even attempt to to. Um, to study economics as a science and to see what these people had to say. Um, there's a, there's, there's just, I mean, there's so much there and it's actually, this is, this is a field that one of the, uh, maybe I'll just say this. I think one of the reasons Lauren and I love our medieval people is there's just still so much that we don't know. Mm -hmm. um, there's still there. In my case, there are still texts sitting in libraries that have not been, really carefully looked at for hundreds hundreds of years right mm -hmm. um and so there's just a lot of basic stuff that still needs to be done and there are whole avenues um the the philosophy of social philosophy um or the philosophy of the social world in the middle ages is just really kind of starting to gain some momentum um maybe just to kind of spin things slightly differently um I do touch upon environmentalism and stewardship and um and insofar as um there 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 are there are lessons uh, again going back to my one of my heroes Ibn Tufail he is an ascetic he thinks it's ludicrous that so many people spend so much time trying to acquire money and property and stuff because it's that's not where it's at um, and also, um, one of the interesting things is that, uh, even the drive to knowledge has to, it can't be so single-minded, um, that it just becomes, you know, a will to power 
and domination over creation. In fact, um, Tufail's character comes to realize that, hey, um, this is God's creation and I have a special place in it. I have role of caretaker. Um, and so he starts going around. Um, he, he does interesting things like uh, separating the weeds from the corn so or the flowers in a, such a way that neither one is killed. So the weeds choke in the flower or the corn. And so he takes care of that thing, but he doesn't just pull up the weed, right? He wants to keep all life for him as sacred. And so maybe if I can, if we allow that as an economic lesson, <laughs> I would say maybe that's one that we really ought to be paying attention to in our current day and age. Yes, economy is ecology. <laughs> they have the same root, right? The household. Um, I believe we're at a stopping point. Is that correct, Gaston? We're at our time, close to our time? Yes. Um, any final comments from Laura, uh, from Laura and then Andrew? Well, why don't I say this? I, I, I'm I, sorry that we had so little time to get uh, questions from the audience. Um, I hope I can speak for Lauren. I'm definitely speaking for myself here. If you have any lingering questions, feel free to find me uh, um, on the web and send me an email. I'm happy to follow up on anything I've said here. Or if you read my book, uh, you can send me a question about that. Just don't ask me questions about Lauren's book. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, I am a biased, uh, a, a biased historian, right? But I will say, right, that this, this book that I put in the chat about religious poverty and the profit economy in medieval Europe, right? I, I like looking at the closed variable case study of monks who are not in the world, because I think I can see their emotions and their experiences more clearly. But there is a lot of theory about what happens when mendicants are in the world and how the sort of ideas of monasticism have to change because they're teaching lay people and they're reacting to lay people, but also how their presence in the world shakes everything up for merchants, for people, you know, the hedonists who live in the city, right, and want to create capitalism, basically. Um, so there is, you know, and, and lots of people like Max Weber mentioned before, right, but think about how the economy is connected to the spiritual sphere. So, you know, if you think what we're talking about is just, a, you know, edifying for the heart and for the religious or whatever, it all spills out into everything in the world. Um, and there's more on that in our classes. <laughs> Fantastic. I want to make sure to point out in the chat a comment from our colleague in philosophy, Anna Gottlieb, who says, it seems to me that there's nothing frivolous or unserious about passion, about how one is moved by ideas. What you are doing is demonstrating what this role looks like in practice. Bravo. And I'll second that. Um, I also wanted to tell a story. I, when we started the publicity for this event, I, I saw a student standing looking at the flyer and I said, what do you think? And the student said, shouldn't the title be a question? Are medieval thinkers relevant? And I said, no, it's just a statement. <laughs> the student looked at me and I looked at the student and I said, well, then you should come to the event and see why. And the student is here. I'm not going to call them out. <laughs> but I do hope and I know that after this conversation in the last hour and 15 minutes, I think that, you know, why it's a statement, it's a lot more understandable. Uh, and so I just wanted to thank you, all three of you, for such an engaging and intellectually challenging conversation. Uh, I wanted to thank Lauren and Andy for these lovely and important books, uh, gateway drugs, as Lauren called them, uh, good gateway drugs. Um, so thank you, thank you so much. And I hope to see you all on Wednesday in person at the Women's Center for our next book event, celebrating Naomi Brain's new book, Abortion Beyond the Law. So once again, thank you, thank you so much to all of you. Bye bye. Bye. Thanks for coming. Yeah, thank you all who yeah. were here in the audience. Thank you for coming. Thanks. Bye. Bye.